Hi, I'm Mark Weitzman, and this is a review video that I'm making for a 8.04x um, current MOOC course on quantum mechanics given by MIT. And um, it's, of course, unofficial. I'm not associated with the course. I am a CTA for the course, Community TA. But other than that, I'm not part of the staff. Anyway, there was a lot of discussion in the forums for an explanation of um, the solution to problem 3A, so I thought I'd make a very short video explaining the answer, maybe clarifying some things. So just as background, about a year ago I made four deep dive videos for my quantum field theory course that I host on Piazza. The videos are also on YouTube. And um, the first three videos basically follow this problem exactly and the solution is almost identical. The fourth video talks about a paradox that was often associated with de Broglie waves and um, it's not really a paradox, obviously there's a resolution and the fourth video shows the resolution. So you might want to take a look at those if you want more clarification on this problem. And um, all of this pertains to the um, covariance covariance of the um, Schrodinger equation under a uh, Galilean transformation. So um, obviously the Schrodinger equation is non-relativistic and uh, the Galilean transformation is a non-relativistic equation. So it's not surprising that this would be the case in this problem, which is usually not um, covered in an introductory quantum mechanics course, really goes through exactly showing this um, covariance. So there was some, um, some confusion on the chain rule, so I'll start by reviewing the chain rule. Let's say we have a single variable calculus, x is an independent variable. And uh, let's say we have um, y is equal to a function of x and z is equal to another function of y. And obviously we can, and this can be substituted in so we get g of f parentheses x. And let's say you want to take the derivative, this is the well-known chain rule, dz dx is equal to dz dy dy dx, which is equal to g prime y f prime x, which is equal to g prime of f of x f prime x. So this is the uh, chain rule which you're all familiar with from single variable calculus. And the multivariable is not much different, we just have more variables. So let's say we have like x1, x2, x3, dot dot dot, xn as independent variables. And let's say we have dependent variables like y1 is equal to f of x1, y2, I'm sorry, f of x1, comma, x2, dot, 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 y2 is equal to another function, let's say, of all these variables, and then y3, dot, dot, dot. Let's make them the same, and make it easier, um, and we just keep doing this. So now, let's say we have a function z is equal to, I'll use psi, but we're not doing any quantum mechanics here. Say we have z is equal to psi of y1, y2, yn. And we want to know what the um, part, so if we were to substitute the y's in here, we would have a huge equation of all the x1's, x2's, which are the independent variables. These over here are the independent variables. Okay, so let's take the partial of z with respect to x1. 
Okay, now how does z depend on x1? Well, all of these variables in here depend upon x1, x2, and so on. y1 is a function of x1 with other variables that are held constant. Same thing with y2 up to yn. So it's kind of obvious, I'm not going to prove anything here, that what you do is you take the partial of psi with respect to y1 times the partial of y1 with respect to x1 plus the partial of psi with respect to y2 times the partial of y2 with respect to x1. Notice the pattern. These two variables are the same and we're going to be summing, doing the whole thing but this one's always the same because that's what we're taking the variable with. We could take the partial of psi with respect to yn, partial of yn with respect to x1. And if we wanted to, we could do the same thing, partial of z with respect to x2. And here we just replace wherever x1 is, we replace it with respect to x2. Okay, so this is the chain rule, and sometimes students get confused when variables aren't named well, and in the solution to the problem, they sort of left out the psi. In other words, they just wrote this as, this is equivalent to writing. It doesn't really matter what, okay, I wrote z and then I, I wrote psi, so z is equal to psi, same thing. It doesn't really matter what z or psi is, so you could just write this as, the partial with respect to x1 is equal to the partial with respect to x1 times the partial of y1 with respect to x1. Nope. Plus the partial of y2. Partial with respect to y2. Partial of y2 with respect to x1. Partial with respect to y n partial y n with respect to x1. So I think students got confused because the function was left out and, and it's sort of implied here. Put any function here, same function, all these other places. Same thing with there. Okay, so right now what I want to do is I want to go back to the Galilean transformation and do this same exact thing. And I'm not going to go to another board because I'm missing my camera woman today, so I limited to this one board. So I'm just going to erase a lot of some of this. We don't need this either. So let's start with the Galilean transformation x equal to x prime plus v t prime and t equal to t prime. So in this particular case we're using x prime and t prime as the independent variables. Okay so this is our Galilean transformation and what we want to do is we want to um, basically do the same thing that we did um, before. So let's, um, let's go through this. If we want to know what the partial of psi with respect to x prime is, again we do the partial of psi, let's say psi depends on x comma t. We do the partial of psi with respect to x times the partial of x with respect to x prime plus the partial of psi with respect to t times the partial of t with respect to x prime. It's important, even though t is equal to t prime, it's important to keep the variables labeled as they are because these are like independent and these are dependent. Okay, what is this? Well, look right here. The partial derivative of x depends on two variables. When you take a partial derivative, one variable is constant and you would, this constant term, so a derivative would be zero. So the partial of x with respect to x prime 
is equal to 1. And what is this? The partial of t with, well, t is a function of t prime, but there is no x prime here, so this is equal to 0. So this is simply equal to, yeah, erase this. So this is simply equal to partial of psi with respect to x. And in the solution, we would write that as the partial with respect to x prime is equal to the partial with respect to x. Now let's do the other variable. The partial of psi of x gamma t with respect to t prime is equal to the partial of psi with respect to t times the partial of t with respect to t prime. Okay, I'm, I want to be consistent here. I always order these variables like x is first and t is second. The opposite that we do in when we really do relativity. So this would be the partial with psi with respect to x, partial of x with respect to t prime, plus the partial of psi with respect to t times the partial of t with respect to t prime. Okay. Now let's evaluate this. The partial of x with respect to t prime. Now, t prime occurs in x, and the partial of x with respect to t prime is just v. Let's do this. Partial of t with respect to t prime, well, that's equal to 1. So, this ends up being v times the partial of psi with respect to x plus the partial of psi with respect to t. And that's equivalent to saying the partial with respect to t prime is equal to v, the partial with respect to x, plus the partial with respect to t. And then in the problem, we use these substitutions to do a lot of calculations. So um, there's really nothing going on here. Um, I think if I did anything different than in the book, I sort of wrote these two terms reversed. Obviously, they multiply. You can write it any way you want. But this, to me, is the easier way to remember it. And um, anytime you're freaked out by not having a function here, just put one in there, and you'll get it.